This is a story from Butch, and Butch has had several run-ins with Bigfoot, and this is a uh, series of encounters he had in an area where he likes to hike. He doesn't tell me where this is, and that's fine. It's the experience that we're interested in. So let's hear what he says. My first encounter with the creature known as Bigfoot was lackluster and quite odd at first, but at least I understood what was going on enough to leave quickly. I was hiking a back trail some miles up in a national state park in New England, and I was quite some distance away from anything or anyone. I approached a pond after a long hike up a logging road that had a beaver hut in the middle of it, and I decided to take a rest. I sat on the side of the bank watching the water and looking at the wind in the trees. It was a sunny, beautiful day, and I was happy to be up there hiking. Just as quickly as I got situated to rest and take in the view, I heard some crackling in the brush behind me in the forest across the road. I got up and walked out to the middle of the road and tried to see what it was, but I couldn't see anything. Just then I heard a loud grunt as if a human was clearing its throat, but it was very deep. So I looked in that direction again, but I still saw nothing. Over and over the grunt came from a short distance in front of me, and I yelled out, Who's there and what do you want? The tree shook, and I was now feeling uneasy about what was taking place. I would love to tell you I had the courage to go find out what was making the noise, but something told me to leave quickly, and so I did. Two weeks later, I got up the courage to go back to that place. So I did, but by another route below the large dam that had the roadway to the dirt trail that led to the area. While I was hiking in that direction, I felt as if I was being watched the entire time. I was uneasy the whole time I shrugged it off and continued to hike. As I got near the same ground as I was on at the first encounter, I called out again and even decided to make a very loud call in the woods, as loud as I could to see if I got any kind of response. This was a big mistake. Suddenly, I heard a boulder come crashing off that hill started hitting other rocks and shaking trees as it violently came down the hill. I heard trees being shaken and snapped. No human could do this. A loud screech came from the woods west of me toward the lake. I realized my mistake and I was now the focus of the attention of this very large creature. I decided again to get out of there and I left at a quick pace. It was a three-mile hike back to the lower dam and I was followed the entire way. I made it safely back to my vehicle, and I left. Three weeks later, I went back. On my trek up the backside of the dam, I heard yet again the cracking of branches off to the right side in the woods a short distance away. I stopped dead in my tracks and looked in that direction with a focus I had never had before. I didn't see anything, but the branches breaking continued. I started walking slowly down the road and peering into the trees to find what was making the racket. And there it was. A black hairy creature stood up from a crouch in the middle of a pine thicket and was staring right at me. And then it whistled at me. I was so shocked that I was seeing it. I literally had to go down to one knee to get my breath. I called out to the creature and it whistled back. I was also greeted by another call from the woods to the rear and the left of this first creature. I could only see the lower half of the second creature. Then a third creature, further back in the woods, out of my line of sight, began what I can only describe as chest thumping. I realized I had stumbled onto a family unit of Bigfoot. I didn't understand what they were trying to get across to me. I made the assumption they wanted me to leave. In fear of being attacked, I once again exited the woods quickly and quietly. I was changed forever. I realized I was not at the top of the food chain. Seeing one is a spectacular experience. Just the appearance of one of these things creates great respect. It seemed to me they were being aggressive to give me a warning, maybe to just warn me to stay away. I got the message loud and clear and I quickly left. This was eight years ago, and I've been looking for them ever since. I have one dull, blurry picture of one and have also had a run-in with them in another part of the park some 20 miles away to the north. I believe they are human. 
I wanted to submit this story to show people that their aggressive behavior is, for the most part, to get you to leave the area. I now know that they are there, and I have a sense of their strength and power. This creature has put me in awe of their very existence. I will continue to hike the forest, and I hope to see one again someday soon. Here's a cool story from Daniel, and here's what he writes. It was the summer of 1989. My name is Daniel, and you are welcome to use my name. I am now disabled, and I live in the state of Georgia. This occurred right on the Pacific Crest Trail in Oregon in the Three Sisters Wilderness area at the foot of these three volcanoes. I am a retired mechanical engineer. At the time, I lived in Hood River, Oregon. I have never had a psychological issue, nor have I ever needed any related help. I was an avid hunter and had hunted this area numerous times in the previous 10 years. My camp was approximately six hours on horseback. This is an awe-inspiring mountain area with a very large timber, yet open meadows. On this trip, my son, along with two teenage friends of his and I, decided to backpack in. We started at the crack of dawn and arrived at the camp around noon. This trip was just to explore for the upcoming hunting season, so my only firearm was a 44 mag revolver that I would always carry into the woods. We finally arrived, we cooked, we ate lunch, and proceeded to scout the area. The day went without any unusual event, and we were excited to see abundant game. After it got dark, we went to sleep around 10 p.m. All four of us in a light nylon tent with semi-transparent material. I'm a very light sleeper because of my Vietnam experience and at about 2 or 3 a.m. was woken up by very heavy bipedal steps approaching the tent. There was a full moon. The person stopped and I could see a very large shadow and I assumed it was just his proximity to the tent blocking the moonlight but along with that, there was a very loud breathing, which I could only associate with a large animal. By that time, I became alarmed. I was sure that it was not a bear because I heard the steps from quite a ways off, perhaps 30 yards, and they were definitely bipedal, and bears do not walk like that for any extended distance. At this moment, I believed there were humans trying to scare us or rob us, so I grabbed my revolver, and out loud I said, Don't come any closer. I've got a gun, and I will shoot. The breathing continued for perhaps 30 more seconds. He could not have been any further than three feet from our tent. By this time, all four of us were very awake, but then all of a sudden, we could hear steps again, this time walking away. I immediately unzipped the tent door and looked into the direction of the steps and with the full moon and no more than 15 yards, we saw this incredibly large hairy animal, at least eight feet tall, probably more, and using my hunting experience, I judged his weight at no less than 800 pounds. He heard us moving around and turned around and we could see his human-like face. The moonlight illuminated him clearly. He let out a blood-curling, hair-raising scream or growl combination that echoed throughout the mountains. We were all terrified. I knew that my revolver could not stop a beast that size before it reached us if he chose to charge, but he turned away and walked very fast and occasionally looking back, and we never heard it again. I know there's a lot of skepticism, but I have no doubt that these species exist. There were four of us, and we all saw it clearly. We talk about the experience to this day 30 years later, and when I ask the then teenagers if they remember, and they all say as though it happened yesterday, yeah. These boys are now grown men which pursue the hunting sport, including my son, and they all have had additional, less dramatic signs, noises, small rock throwing at the tent at night, etc. For many years, we did not talk with anyone other than amongst ourselves, but nowadays, there are many sightings. Please remember, we lived for more than a century with mountain gorillas, and it was only relatively recent that we discovered them. 
All right, here's an email from Kathy. This is fantastic. This I love reading this story, and I hope you guys like it as much as I did. Kathy writes, my father was the second youngest of 10 kids. He and his twin sister were born in 1945 at their family home in Clay, West Virginia. He grew up being called Buckshot, and until I was 9 or 10 years old, I thought that was his Christian name. Although he passed away in 2017, he told a story many times before he died. My brother was with him when it happened, and he has never discredited a word of my dad's story, so I have no doubt that this story is true. 1978, when my brother Phil was 11, Dad said, Come on, boy, it's time. You're going to go on your first raccoon hunt. Our father's love for raccoon hunting was infectious, so Phil was tickled to death to be joining him for the first time. They put on their coal miners' light helmets and strapped the battery packs to their waists, and they headed out. The only one more excited for the hunt that night than my brother was was my dad's favorite dog. He was a walker named Pretty Boy. Whenever he saw Dad getting ready, he always started panting and barking and dancing around his legs. He knew they were going hunting, and he couldn't wait to see the tailgate drop on my dad's 1976 Chevy Love truck so he could load up. That night, my dad and brother drove 20 miles to his friend Rick's place. Rick had several dogs of his own, along with two teenage sons who also hunted. They decided where they'd be going, and they set out as it was getting dark. They knew they'd have good luck that night because the farmer who lived there had been complaining about the raccoons getting into his feed bins. With their good quality hunting dogs and their own skills, they were sure to be able to relieve the farmer of at least a few of those pests. Dad, Rick, and the boys walked the dogs out on leashes, located a scent trail, and turned them loose. After that, it was only a matter of time before the dogs treed. Until then, all they had to do was settle in near their trucks and wait and listen. It didn't take long. Within 15 minutes, the dogs had treed. My dad said they were real close. They turned on their lights and started up the mountains towards the sound of the dogs. They had to cross a barbed wire fence, but they found the dogs at the base of a large beech tree. In West Virginia, these trees, with their pale, almost white bark, can grow to massive proportions. It can take three men with their arms stretched wide to reach around the circumference of one. Because of the tree's size and the fact that it still had branches of dead leaves here and there, they thought they might have difficulty seeing the raccoon. But once the dogs were leashed and pulled away from the tree, however, they discovered they'd have no trouble spotting what the hounds had treed. But it wasn't a raccoon. Sitting up on the branches of the tree, covered in reddish-brown hair, was a young Sasquatch. It was six feet tall, and Dad described it as looking like a tall, skinny orangutan with a face like a man. It looked down on them with glowing red eyes and bared its big square teeth and sharp canines at them. That's when it screamed, and it hit them in the chest like a Mack truck. Phil and the other two boys fell to the ground and began to cry. Rick stood frozen in place, and he was unable to move. The dogs cowered in submission, but Pretty Boy managed to crawl over to where Phil was and he laid across him. A second later, an answering scream came from somewhere in the distance, followed by another one that sounded like it was a mile or so away. That was what shook my dad back to reality. He pushed Pretty Boy off of Phil and helped him to his feet before punching Rick in the arm and saying, let's get the heck out of here. Yeah, let's, Rick answered as he helped the boys up off the ground. Let's go. Their dogs led them down the mountain as they all hightailed it back to the woods. They were only about halfway there when they heard something behind them come crashing through the woods. It sounded like a bulldozer following them. At that point, Dad picked up Phil like a football and broke into a dead run. He cleared the three-strand barbed wire fence and didn't stop until he reached the truck. The dogs were there waiting for them. Whatever had chased them down the mountain never caught up with them, but stayed just close enough to keep them motivated. 
From the top of the mountain came another screaming sound. Daddy thought it had to be a second one, but they weren't going to hang around to find out. He loaded my brother and his dog into the front of his truck while Rick loaded the boys and dogs into theirs and they all sped off. Dad headed straight for home and didn't stop till he got there. For him and my brother, it was the end of a harrowing experience. For Rick and his family, however, it was just the beginning. Dad and Phil had a 20-mile drive to make, and Rick and his boys lived a short seven miles away. As soon as he got home, he told his wife all about what happened that night. They'd been home about 30 minutes, and Rick was still trying to gain control of his heart rate, when the same screams they'd heard up on the mountain started coming from the woods behind their barn, about 100 yards from the house. Rick's wife was furious. You brought those things here. I've got babies in this house, and you brought those things here? And she yelled at him, get rid of them now. Rick sent her and the kids upstairs with the warning not to come down no matter what she might hear. He then walked around their farmhouse and secured all the doors and windows. As the screams got closer, rocks the size of baseballs began landing on the tin roof. Soon, something was walking around the house with heavy stomps that shook their antique hutch and rattled the china plates that were a gift from his wife's granny. He'd brought the dogs inside with him when they got home, but they were hiding under the bed and were of no use. Every ten minutes or so, something slapped the side of the house or tapped on the window. Rick's nerves had just about reached their limit when he heard his wife screaming from upstairs. He ran up to find her pointing at the window in near hysterics. I saw a face in that window, she claimed, but that was impossible. That window was 12 feet off the ground. Call the law, she pleaded. Do you think they're going to believe me when I tell them we have a 12-foot peeping Tom outside our window? Rick reasoned with her. They'll lock us up. After his wife screamed, there were no more sounds from outside. They were all able to get the kids settled down and into bed, but Rick and his wife stayed up the rest of the night. Once the sun came up, he went outside and walked around the house. Then he went back inside and he called Buckshot. My dad got there as quickly as he could. He had his Winchester 270, his 357 pistol, and Rick grabbed his 12-gauge Remington and together they went around the house, the barn, and the perimeter fence. They found rocks on the low side of the roof and footprints all around the house. The largest of the tracks measured 24 inches long and 10 inches across with five toes. Where those prints stood under the upstairs window, they sank three inches into the ground. That must have been our peeping Tom, you reckon, said Rick. Another set of prints measured 16 inches long and eight inches across, but they only had four toes. The third set was smaller, still at 12 inches, and they only had four toes, too. Rick and Dad estimated the smallest set must have been the one their dogs had treed, while the middle-sized set must have been the mother, and the largest set belonged to the daddy, or the alpha male. Within the week, Rick and his wife moved to North Carolina, where her family lived, but he and my dad remained friends over the years. And by the way, the place they were hunting that night It's called Booger Holler. How about another story from the UK? This email is from Jim. Here's what Jim writes. My name is Jim and I live in Devon in the UK. This story is 100% true. I feel like I have to say that because if I wasn't there and been the one to experience this encounter, I would have not have believed it myself. When I first moved to Devon about five years ago, I had a seriously strange encounter. For the record, I'm a no-bullcrap-spit-on-the-floor kind of guy. I'm from London, where we say it as we see it. I've never told anyone about this. You think you guys over the water get ripped for seeing stuff? Try being over here, where most will just call you a looney tune. We are a nation that prides itself on our rationality, the old stiff upper lip and all that malarkey. It may sound stereotypical, but that's just us across the pond. This is the odd thing. I know we have our fair share of weirdness in the United Kingdom, but this really took the biscuit, so to speak. 
I was camping out on Dartmoor National Park. We have a couple of cryptids around here like alien big cats, hellhounds, sea monsters, and some really spooky ghostly stuff as well. As a guy who's loved this stuff from a year dot, I want to say I'm not one of those gung-ho types, but I thought I'm going to see if what they say is true. It was a quite pleasant end of a September day when I went out over there. I'm a curious little fella who is also an ex-Special Forces, so I kind of know what I'm doing. So if I can, why not? Dartmoor is a funny place to go hiking in. You need two sets of clothes even in the summer. The terrain changes rapidly and so does the temperature. That is to say, if you go to the top of the tours in the summer, you'll be wearing winter clothing. But I digress. I wound up in Whitman's Forest. This is one weird place. The trees grow at angles and rocks have moss on them. It's a real Lord of the Rings kind of place. Some of the locals claim it was a druid holy site. I thought if I wanted to see an ABC, that would be the place to tuck myself out of sight. So I found a lovely spot where all this stuff's about. I built my camp, and then I went and put some trail cams about. After that came the long wait. I sat there by a roaring fire and watched a really beautiful sunset. If only it had stayed that mellow the rest of the night. By midnight, I was ready to go hunting, as it were. I was hoping at least to get a cast of a footprint, but as you know, in our game, it can be a long wait even for that much. I ventured further to Dartmoor. It's quite a big forest for England, but it opens up to more lands. I was over there for about an hour, and suddenly I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched. The hackles on my back of my neck started to prick up, and now every instinct I had learned or have naturally well Suffice it to say that my spider senses were tingling. Straight away, I went to the relative safety of my camp. Knowing there were other indigenous animals in that place, I already set up my alerts. I sat down and was having a couple of beers trying to chill out, but I couldn't shake that feeling of being watched, tracked, or stalked. It had to be one of those because I was at least two miles from my camp when the feeling started and I still had it back at... I was at least two miles from my camp when that feeling started, and when I got back to camp, the feeling was still there. I was getting pretty freaked out by now, and my mind was going 20 directions at once. Was it kids on the wind-up? Nah, why would they be here? A ranger? Again, no, they don't go there, full stop. Then I thought, it's a serial killer. They could dump your body over there and you'd never be found. Or it could be Satanists, maybe, or pagans. At some point in its history, Dartmoor Forest was a sacred grove. That's when I heard the first twig snap. I immediately picked up my billhook. A billhook is a machete with a curve at the top. I also had my pocket knife in my other hand, and then I saw a set of glittering eyes in the light of the night. I announced my presence, and I said, I can see you there. Come out where I can see you. All I got in reply was a low kind of whistle. I gathered that whatever was looking at me was definitely not a human. The eyes alone told me that. I've lived with a few different indigenous peoples around the world. I felt this relative to my experience. In a stern voice, I said, I'm not here to do anyone or anything any harm. I'm merely passing through. You're welcome to come share my fire if you come in peace. And this is something I learned in the Congo in Africa. In other words, if you want what I've got, come to me and get it. I still had my blades drawn. I sat down by my fire, my blades on my lap. And that's when it stood to its full height. I uttered a pretty nasty expletive as I thought, you're a big one, ain't you? My training kicked in and I was working out his size and how long he could go. And then this thing strode across my campsite. I saw it with my own eyes. He or she was seven feet tall and built like a brick blank blank. Well, you get the idea, mate. It was covered in long shaggy hair like an orangutan. Except it didn't walk on its knuckles like most apes do. 
and there was an intense smell to it as well. I sat there with my blades on my lap, making no movement at all. In fact, I pretended not to be paying attention to it. I really couldn't tell what sex it was, and in less than a minute, he or she walked through my camp. With that, I felt the animosity from earlier disappear. The rest of the night was perfect. I actually think it had come to work out what my intentions were in the forest. I never believed in the wood woes, that's what we call them in medieval times, but when I hear stuff like your wickedly awesome channel, <laughs> I have to wonder. Besides, I know what I saw. It seemed in action, indeed not so aggressive or isolated as Bigfoot or over in the States, or as elusive as the Australian Yowie. Although, I think they scent tag an area like most primates do, other than us. I only say this because the smell lingered. It was still reeking when I left. Well, that's my tale. Please, if you could, be so bold as to give your opinion on this. I'm a bit stumped, mate. Cheers, Jim. Well, Jim, I don't have an opinion, dude. That was your story. I'm sorry, I called you dude. Mate. I have to learn to call people in other countries what they're accustomed to being called to, mate. Anyway, I don't have an opinion, but it's an unbelievable story. I, I, I think you're asking my opinion because maybe uh, you have the idea that I know a lot about these things and I don't. I don't. I, you know, somebody asked me the other day, said, what all do you know about Bigfoot? And I said, I, I don't know much about them. Never seen one, never seen a track. I don't know anything at all about them. And I'm not going to pretend like I do, like some people do. And to be honest, I'm a little curious, but I'm not really eat up with knowing a lot about Bigfoot. To answer your question, I don't think I have an opinion. Although I will say, based on the stories that I have narrated up until now and read so far, I think it's quite unusual for one of these things to walk right through your camp. I don't... I. I don't think I've narrated a story like that, but I have heard two stories like that from people who are, uh, let's just say, big storytellers in the Bigfoot world. Actually, they told me the stories face to face. I was with them. They were telling me and a whole bunch of people around a campfire, and they're great stories, and I don't really doubt them. I don't doubt them because other people saw it too. So it does happen. But I think it's quite rare for one of these creatures to just walk right through your camp. But what an experience. I mean, uh, my takeaway from that would be I got to see something that very, very, very few people see in this world. That's what I think when I'm standing in waist-high water in the middle of the winter in a swamp, hunting over a spread of decoys. And I get to see ducks. A lot of times when the ducks come in, I won't even shoot because I'm seeing something that so few people in the world ever get to see. Here's an email from Christopher, and I got this about a year ago. And here's what Christopher writes. This is going to this is gonna blow your doors off. This is pretty crazy. I've been considering telling this story to someone for over 25 years. The main reason to talk after all these years is because I hear other accounts that don't jibe with what I saw. I love your channel and I picked you because of two things. I live in Georgia and it sounds good to hear someone that could be my neighbor or uncle. You're all so fair and the stories are exciting and I like your commentary on them. Now on to my encounter. Back in the early 90s when I was a 20-something young buck, Two buddies and I ran a huge plant nursery, and after work, we did some landscaping with the plants that we sold all day. I had a brand new truck and apartment, and life was good. The nursery was owned by an old man named K.C. K.C.'s brother was a distinguished attorney and had been elected mayor. K.C., on the other hand, was a foul-mouthed school bus driver who happened to own his own nursery. These two brothers were polar opposites. That's small town Georgia for you. KC raked in the cash and we ran the place from top to bottom. The nursery was located behind his house on a steep grade heading down to the woods. We grew and sold every plant that would grow in Georgia. We actually built the whole growing area for him. We cut steps in the side of that hill and we built growing beds with old railroad ties. 
And for all our hard work, KC paid us well, and he gave us full run of the place. It was a big plot of land, and not all of it was used for the nursery. We were also allowed to hunt on his property. A half mile into the woods, I built a camo tree house to hunt from. It was located on a great spot where two trails converged, and I had a large killing field when the deer showed up. The stand was four feet by eight feet with a roof on it. It was a comfortable place to spend a day hunting. I was in the stand before daylight on a cold Sunday morning. A 12-point buck had come through a time or two, but I never had a good shot at him. Shortly after daylight, I heard movement in the distance of an animal of some weight. It was my buck, or that is what I thought. It was coming towards me, so I settled in to stay completely still. It was strange, though, because the woods had gone completely silent other than this animal coming towards me with each step. That should have been a clue to me, but I was young and dumb. I knew a Bigfoot, but to me it was something in the Pacific Northwest, if it existed at all. 200 yards away, I began to see the trees parting. They were getting knocked down pretty good, and the racket. I thought this had to be one of three things. It was either a man, a big hog, or a bear. We have bears here, but no one ever sees them. However, one bear made front page news in the local paper after it was found digging in a dumpster behind a Captain D's. But that was a while back. I kept waiting and wondering what in the world could make so much racket and push trees around like that. My treehouse stand was well camouflaged. It was enclosed and it was spray painted camo. Camo net was all over it and plenty of limbs and piled up brush stuck to it. It had shooting slats on all four sides. By this time, I figured that whatever was heading my way was not a deer. If it was a man, he was about to catch an earful from me. On three sides, there was a pretty steep hill that opens up into a pretty good sized bear area. It was a perfect kill zone with two game trails that ran right through it. The thing, or the guy, kept coming, and by this time, the sun was out good, and I could see better. It was finally at the bottom of the hill where I sat, and from my vantage point, I could see the top of its head. I thought he was wearing a brown sock cap. His dark face was now visible, and I figured it was one of the neighbors who lived close by. I looked closer, and with the light now different on his face, I realized it was not one of our black neighbors. He wasn't black at all. It was the tan color of an old baseball glove. None of this made sense, and I began to get worried. I should have raised my rifle to look through the scope, but I never thought about that. I would have been able to see what this thing was a few minutes earlier, but now I could see it clearly, and it was close. It was covered with long, shaggy hair, except on its knees and its face. There were areas on its hide where the hair was missing. It made me think it had a disease like a dog gets mange. It was maybe seven feet tall and three feet wide at the shoulders. This was a monster. I have never seen anything move with so little effort through the woods and brush. It was like he was gliding and he was making good time. Now he was only 20 yards in front of me and I could see everything now and I was terrified. He was almost beneath me. I thought he would hear my heart pounding, but in the middle of all this, somehow my fear turned to amazement and curiosity, and I thought that I might be experiencing the best sighting anyone has ever had of a Bigfoot, and I was getting away with it. I was recording all of the things about his appearance in my mind, and I would soon take notes when I got back to my truck. But then things changed. He stopped right under me. He tilted his head back and he began sniffing the air. He moved around a bit below me and I heard something hit the bottom of the tree stand. I think he knocked his head on it and it annoyed him. I actually almost laughed, but I knew better. I was still well hidden and 10 feet above him. He started getting froggy on me and he came out from under the stand. He went down on all fours and he scanned the area slowly and methodically. It was like he was taking in every branch and shrub. He was swaying back and forth, kicking dirt and leaves, and seemingly getting more angry by the minute. 
I was praying that he wasn't looking for me, and I was praying that it wasn't me that was making him angry. I backed away from the shooting hole, and I could only hear him now. The tree stand has a rope ladder that I had already pulled up long ago. He wasn't going to climb up, but I still didn't feel secure. The roar this thing let out was something I can't begin to describe. It shook the entire hill. Trees seemed to sway and vibrate. It sounded like his lungs were the size of a Volkswagen, and it paralyzed me. I felt like both eardrums were going to blow out, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I peed in my pants. Make fun of me if you want, but I dare you to hear this from 15 feet away. You might do the same thing. And I could hear him moving around below. One minute he was in front, and then he was behind me. I think he was looking for me. I know he was. I raised up to the shooting slot, and I could see him circling the stand. Half the time he was on two legs, and then he would drop down to all fours. It was just so strange. Finally, his head snapped around, and he looked right at me. He had found what he was looking for. He was at the base of the tree now. What I thought was a unique vantage point to observe an unknown creature was now a life-or-death situation. I eased back away from the slat and I flipped the safety off my 30 alt 6 And then the thing started to climb. I quickly moved back to the slat and I looked out and I saw its hand gripping one of the trees my stand was framed to. It was only a foot or so below me and I was panicking, I'll be honest. But in the middle of the terror, I remembered the 45 ACP I carried on my hip. I pulled it from the holster and was about to start shooting through the floor to stop this thing. I really had no choice. It was going to jerk me out of that stand and it was going to kill me. Both hands on the 45, I started to pull the trigger. And I hesitated because I felt like it had stopped climbing. I could still hear the noises on the other side of that plywood, but the thing had stopped. I released the pressure on the trigger and I waited. Clicking noises came from the woods out in front of me. The noises were loud. Nothing in the woods sounds like that. Then a loud whistle and then more clicking. There was another one close by, and my fear doubled. There was no way out of this, but the creature hanging under me let go, and he dropped to the ground. I heard it. I raised my head to look out, and I could see it running towards the clicking sounds, and then it was gone. I never saw the other one, and after that, I never saw my guy again, and then the woods went quiet. I often wonder what happened that day. Did the second one have pity on me? Was its mate or parent scolding the big male that had me located? I eventually stopped guessing and I went on with my life, and I was thankful that it worked in my favor. I didn't tell a soul for 10 years, and finally confiding in my wife and my best friend when the Bigfoot shows became popular on TV. I don't know if they believe me still. These Bigfoot are real, and some of these Bigfoot hunters are in for a big surprise if they ever find one. They aren't cuddly koala bears. These things are intelligent. They're fast enough to catch you, and they're strong enough to kill you in a split second. We're dealing with some form of human, whether it's a relic, a hybrid, or something never discovered. It's a part of the human family tree. I think one day DNA will prove this. These creatures are not apes. I believe hundreds of years ago there were probably more of them. Here is a description of the Bigfoot that I saw. It was at least 10 feet tall. It hit its head on the bottom of my shooting platform. From the ground to the floor is 9 foot 8 inches. The skin on its face was a tan color and it was leathery. Its hair was mainly deep red and brown with patches of hair missing. There were, however, dark patches here and there and it gave it an almost brindle color. The hair on its head seemed long and appeared similar to dreadlocks. The hands looked human, and they were tipped with black nails, but three times the size of my hands. Its eyes were a hazel color with a tint of green. The nose seemed flatter to its face than a human nose, but it also had a Roman shape that ended with a pronounced tip. It was handsome in a strange way. The lower jaw protruded a bit, and above its eyes was a heavy, 
protruding brow. There was virtually no neck, and the ears looked human except for the color. And last, there was a feature overall about this creature that looked as if his face vaguely resembled a human with Down syndrome. I cannot explain it, but I came away with that sense. Thank you for reading my counter. It is all 100% true. Signed, Christopher. Here's an email from J.W. Here's what he writes. There was a road we used to drive into the Brackish Swamp in eastern Harris County, east of Houston, Texas. And in the daylight, it wasn't the least bit scary. In fact, it was beautiful. Oak trees draped in Spanish moss and tall grass and flowers were everywhere we looked. But at night, it was a different story. Those big oak trees closed in and turned the world to pitch. As the saying goes, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We like to find people who had never been on that road and then take them down it at night. There was a steep drop, and just before we'd get to the bottom, we'd turn off the headlights and scare the hell out of them. We did it many times, never failing to scare the living crap out of teenage girls, and never once having a problem. One night, my friend Charles decided to take our friend Jesse down there and scare him. Charles was a few years older than me. He'd gone to school with my brother, but when they graduated, my brother joined the Navy. Back then, volunteering for the military meant you had a choice. If you waited to be drafted, you were usually sent straight to Vietnam. Well, that night, we were in Charles's truck and heading down the road. It was a two-lane blacktop called Wallaceville Road that no one lived on. Charles was driving his F-100 at 55 miles an hour, and Jesse was already a little freaked out by the speed we were going on that road. Right at the drop, Charles cut the lights, and Jesse started screaming for him to turn them back on. I was laughing inside and doing my best not to do so out loud. And then Charles turned the lights back on, and boom, we hit something. It happened so fast that we never saw what it was. It was just a blur. Charles slammed on the brakes, and whatever it was went up into the hood and over the top of the truck. And we sat there for a minute staring at the road, and we were all pretty shaken up. What did we hit? Jesse asked. His voice was trembling. We were all looking at each other, but no one answered. Finally, Charles opened his door and he got out. I exited the passenger side, but Jesse stayed in the truck. We walked to the front to survey the damage. There was a big dent in the bumper, and there was blood and hair. Scratch marks traced a path across the hood along with more hair and blood. I could feel the silence closing in on us. At first, I didn't know if it was my own shock or if everything had actually gone quiet. I focused on the only sound I could hear. That was the truck's engine, running. Charles pulled a flashlight out from behind a seat and walked to the back of the truck and then further up the road a few yards. He didn't see anything, so we got back in and we backed up to where we thought we'd hit whatever this was. Charles positioned the truck to angle the headlights into the woods. We still didn't see anything, so we got out. But not Jesse, though. He wouldn't get out. He begged us not to, either. We could still hear Jesse as we walked down what looked like a narrow path. We'd made it 15 yards past the reach of the headlight when the horn started honking repeatedly. With a quick glance at each other, we took off at a dead run back up to the truck. Jesse was inside and he was covered in sweat and shaking uncontrollably with all the windows rolled up. I grabbed the door handle, but it was locked. Charles found the door was locked, too. We pounded on the windows and we demanded that Jesse let us in, but he wouldn't, or he couldn't, respond. It was several minutes before he regained control of his senses and unlocked the doors. We tried to get him to tell us what happened, but he just sat there shaking and sweating. We decided it was better to get out of there, so we left as fast as we could. We drove back toward the highway and lights, but Jesse never uttered a word. We dropped him at his house on North Shore, but again, he never spoke. He climbed out of the truck, and he walked slowly to the front door with his arms down at his side like some sort of funeral march. 
We watched him go inside before heading to my house, where Charles dropped me off. I didn't go in right away. I sat outside and thought over what had happened, and a million questions were going through my mind. What had we hit, and what did Jesse see that shook him up so badly, and why wouldn't he talk to us? The next morning, I called Jesse, but he still wasn't talking. I had to walk the two miles to Charles' apartment because he didn't have a phone. His truck was sitting out front, and I stopped to look it over. There were three deep scratches about one inch apart and five inches long on the hood. Well, I knocked on the door, and Charles came out to look at the damage with me. We decided to go over to Jesse's and talk to him, but his mother met us at the door, and she was furious. What did you do to Jesse last night, she demanded. He wouldn't tell her. He wouldn't tell anybody. He wouldn't even come out of his room. I was 13 when that happened. Jesse was 16 and Charles was 18. It was almost two years before Jesse spoke to me again. And when he finally did, all I ever got out of him was that something came out of the woods after Charles and I went down the path. It started shaking the truck, he said. He closed his eyes and he couldn't bring himself to open them again. He blindly groped for the horn, and when he found it, he just kept honking it, and then the shaking stopped when we came back. That was the first time something weird ever happened to me. There was a second incident that happened four years later while I was fishing near the San Jacinto River in East Harris County, Texas, but I won't tell you that story now. I lost touch with those boys over the years, and I wonder if either of them is still around. I'm 62 years old now, and this is the first time I've spoken about this. Maybe I blocked it out somehow. And that's the end of his email. That You know, I, I don't know. Some of that story kind of makes me laugh, and some of that story makes me uh, just terribly feel sorry for Jesse. But these guys were just riding around playing tricks on each other. You know, that happened to me one time. And actually, my dad did that to me. We were going down a dark road on our way to his cabin, and he just reached up and turned the lights out. And I was like, holy crap, I, I, I thought I had blacked out or something. It was so dark. But I know that's a funny thing to do to people. Just, you know, you can't hardly do it now with these new trucks and new cars. The lights are like automatic. But something came back after this truck. Apparently, it was whatever they hit, and it was shaking the truck. Who knows what it was, but can you imagine how scared you would be if you were in that truck and something was standing beside it shaking it as if it was trying to get in? That would scare me to death. JW, I really appreciate you sending this story. It was great. It was different. It was a different type of encounter story, and I think it was fantastic. So thank you, sir, for sending this. Here's an email from Danny, and Danny writes, I've been a Bigfoot enthusiast since I was a teenager, and I saw the Patterson-Gimlin film. I'm almost 69 years old now, and still just as enthusiastic. I want to share a few things with you that don't necessarily have to be put in your show. I just wanted to share some things that have happened in West Virginia. Well, Danny, this these stories are so good. I'm putting them in a video. I hope you don't mind. I live in the westernmost county of West Virginia. I left here in 1970 for a career in the Navy in Norfolk, Virginia. I spent 19 and a half years there, and as I always say, God wanted me back here, so he stationed me back home for my last four years before retirement. The first encounter is from my dad. I never thought he would admit to seeing a Bigfoot because he's always said that there's a reasonable explanation for things that you think you see. One day... When the subject of Bigfoot came up, I expected to hear him say that he didn't believe in them. Then he shared a story of something that happened to him either before he left for World War II or after he came home. He was at home on my grandfather's farm. The large field out in front of the house had been plowed and worked up and ready to plant corn. The field and a pasture field was separated by a creek that ran between them. Part of the pasture was also woodland and hills. The day this happened, he was on his way to the pasture, and as he crossed the yard, he heard a loud roar and a scream 
as if something had attacked a woman. He wondered what it was and began to walk the path to the creek in order to get a better look at the area of the field where the sound was coming from. When he got to the place where he could see the entire field, he saw this big black thing that looked like a man crossing the field. It walked to the fence line at the edge of the field and creek and stepped over the fence like stepping over a doorway. It then had to step over the bank to the creek, cross over it, and up the bank on the other side. He said he watched it cross the pasture and walk into the woods. I was surprised that he admitted to all this, and he never revised his story. My first encounter was as a teenager. I grew up on a small 40-acre farm that basically sat between two hills, as we call it here, in a holler. My home was at the lower part of the farm, and in a narrow part between the hills, Dad had built a one-acre pond for fishing as a pay lake and as a source of water to water our gardens in the summer. I spent my youth roaming those hills, hunting, camping, and just wandering around like farm boys do. One evening, I was fishing, and just as it began to get dark, my sixth sense kicked in, and I realized that something wasn't right. There were no frogs singing, birds, or bugs, or anything. Everything was silent, just dead calm. As I realized that something was going on, I heard up in the woods on the hill opposite from where I was, something walking through the leaves just inside the wood line. I knew it wasn't a deer because at that time we didn't have deer in our area, and I also knew it wasn't a bear because we didn't have them either. There was a long pause between each step, and I could tell it was stepping flat-footed on the leaves. That sixth sense told me that it was time to leave. I just picked up my gear and started walking home. The sound followed me until I got to the dam of the lake and started walking down the road to the house, and it just stopped. Another event happened back in 2005 while I was working the evening shift at our main post office here in Huntington, West Virginia. I usually got off at 11 or 12 unless I had to work over. I live in a small community again between two hills. Almost everything here is between hills in some way. There's also a large creek that separates the community and another hill, and along this hill there's a train track and further up, some individual homes located along a hilltop road. It was during the summer, so the nights were warm. The night this happened, I was getting home around 2 in the morning. When I pulled into the driveway and got out of the car, I noticed that every dog for a mile was barking and creating a ruckus. I wondered what had them so riled up. About that time on the hill above the creek, I heard a huge roar that lasted for several seconds. It echoed off the hills like nothing I had ever heard. The instant it stopped, every dog in the area shut up. All I could do was smile and say there's a Bigfoot for sure. Have an email here from Eli. I got this email several months ago, and here's what Eli writes. Hey, Cam, I love your channel. And I appreciate what you do here, giving folks a platform without taking a stance either way and just presenting the stories. Well, that's what we do. That's what we're doing. I have one for you that happened to me in the backwoods of Arkansas back in the early 90s. I don't mind if you use my first name, but let's keep my last name between you and I. My name is Eli, and this is my story. In 1994, I was 13 years old. I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot out in the very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. It was a series of networked dirt roads to get to their house. The closest neighbor lived a mile and a half away, and the closest town was 10 miles down the road. It's in the middle of farmland, and it's mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child. A general store served the people in the area. It was a two-mile walk from my grandmother's place. An old lady ran the store. Her and her husband had added the store on the front of their house. They lived in the back. My grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get her a few things. She gave me some money, and I headed that way. It was early in the day, and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. 
Things can get creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall. It's a darkness unlike most people who have lived primarily in the cities or towns have ever experienced. I was easily distracted at that age, and I stopped at a creek on the way, and I stayed too long catching crawdads and throwing rocks in the water. And then I piddled all the way to the store. It was getting late, and I picked up my pace. By the time I left the store, it was getting dark. I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone in the dark, so I hurried as fast as I could. I would jog a while, and then I would sprint. I was doing anything in my power to get back as quickly as possible, but it wasn't enough. By the time I made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge where I had wasted all that time earlier, it was dark. I could see the road and the woods all around me because of a glowing moon that was coming over the horizon. It shined an eerie glow across the land. In one way, I was glad that I could see, but in another, the moonlight made it all very creepy. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. Another half mile and I would be home. I could see the porch lights way off in the distance, and I felt relieved. My eyes were fully adjusted to the dark at this point, and the light from the moon allowed me to see all the way across the field on my right. I was getting closer and had actually slowed down a bit. I was tired from the run. I heard something in the woods on my left. Leaves were crunching. Something was walking in there. Keeping my eyes on the woods, I kept moving. There was no way for me to see anything clearly inside the woods, even though the moonlight was shining. But in the ditch closest to the trees, I could make out a dark figure. I stopped and focused on that spot for a few seconds, and it was something. And now it was moving towards me. I thought it was a dog, but then I realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then I realized it wasn't really actually walking on four legs. It was crawling or creeping like a person would. I couldn't take my eyes off this thing. A jolt of fear shot through me when I realized this thing was trying to sneak up on me. It was stalking me. I started walking again, and I kept my eyes on it only a few yards behind me now. A few steps into my walk, the thing stood upright. It was big. I'm guessing it was seven feet tall, and it looked like it was covered in dark hair. But it wasn't a bear. Bears aren't that tall. I had never seen anything like this. I dropped the bag of stuff that I had been carrying, and I ran as fast as my legs could take me towards my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing and a growling sound behind me. It was up on the road with me now, and I could hear its feet crunching the gravel. I never turned around. It was going to catch me at any second. I couldn't make my legs go fast enough. It was so close to me that I closed my eyes in anticipation of it grabbing me. But at that moment, I heard it crash off into the woods to my left. For whatever reason, it had let me go. It was right on me and it could have taken me down if it wanted to, but it let me go. When it was a short distance away into the woods, I heard a scream. I don't think I could replicate that scream now, but I'm telling you, I'm never going to forget that scream. By the time I reached the house, my heart felt like it would explode from the run and the adrenaline pumping through my body. I flew into the house and in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, trying to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but she knew something had scared me. She acted weird about the whole thing the rest of that night. She said it must have been a dog, but that wasn't a dog I saw on the road. The next morning I woke up and I found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath a shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a rational man, down to earth, and had grown up and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of that place. It was mapped into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noises they made, where to find them, and how to catch them, etc. 
I had only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but I'd been going out in those woods with him since a pretty young age on walks. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what had happened to me the night before, and I told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up, and it definitely was not a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid, and he knew that I knew the things he'd taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eye, and he said, I know what you saw. I've seen it before, too. There's things in the woods that people don't understand, and they ought not be fooled with ever. I'll remember those words clearly to this day because it gave me affirmation, but at the time, it made me realize that whatever I'd seen was real, and it was beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods, there are some cliffs, and at the bottom of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it when the creature, fitting the same description, emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He took a shot at it. He missed, and then this thing gave chase. But my grandpa was on the top, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go a long distance and then climb up, which he said it quickly began to do, so he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. The whole way back home, he felt as if he were being watched, and he kept hearing twigs snap behind him, and he was certain that it was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd come from, and he saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and howling noises from outside. It walked around on the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, garbled voice. But it didn't sound like a language, just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling, so my grandpa grabbed a shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the darkness. He heard it run back into the woods. That was the last he'd seen or heard of it, but over the years he heard of other farmers' cows being mutilated or someone's hunting dog going missing, or someone would have a story about some strange creature they had seen in the woods. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she absolutely has refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, which explains her acting weird about it when I told her about what happened to me. I know the story is pretty far-fetched, and you can believe it or not. It makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what he saw, and neither of us had ever felt the need to convince anyone else. I've never spoken of it to anyone other than a few close to me and my grandfather, and he passed away over 10 years ago. And now I'm sharing it with you. These things are just as real as you and I, and just like people, they come in all manner of personality and temperament. These aren't just stories. These are people's memories of a creature that lives in our woods. Signed, Eli. Here's a story from the United Kingdom. I thought this was really good. Uh, the writer's name is Jay, and there's a couple of locations in here that have names I'm going to have trouble pronouncing. So let's see how I do. He he gave me the phonetic spelling so that maybe I can get it right, but let's give it a whirl. I live in Cluid County in North Wales, United Kingdom. I'm lucky to live in such a beautiful place surrounded by hills and woodland and an abundance of farms. We also have a lot of paved roads that lead to the more secluded areas. There was a spot on one of these narrow roads to nowhere that I and my friend Scott liked to go where we could chill out and enjoy some good banter and good chat. The spot we frequented was a lay-by about a third of the way up a damaged road with a steep incline and many hairpin turns as it snaked in an S up the side of the small mountain. The road was edged with 40 to 50 foot conifers, some ash and a few large oaks. 
Just off the road was a large piece of woodland. I say large because on our tiny island, 300 acres is large. On this stretch of road where there are no street lights, homes were few and far between and were inset back, so any lights from them didn't reach the road. It was dark as dark can be out there at night. One fall evening, Scott and I visited our usual spot with another friend we called Jack. We had been there maybe an hour, paying no mind to any of the surrounding area outside of the white 92 Nissan Merker we had bundled into. We were laughing and having a good time, just enjoying each other's company. We hadn't even noticed how quiet the woods were. Suddenly, the inside of the car went silent as well. Everyone stopped talking, and Scott reached past the steering wheel to silence the radio. We were all sure we had heard something really close. A thud made me wind down the window on the passenger side to listen. That was when I realized I couldn't hear anything in the woods. We have an abundance of wildlife in this area, another reason I feel so lucky to live here. There are rabbits and squirrels, red fox, badger, deer, owls, and other birds of prey like kite and buzzards. At that moment, none of them were making a sound. Not even the insects could be heard. The only noise that broke the silence was the light rustling that was coming from a field that was situated up a steep embankment just to our left. It was coming from the other side of the field. We thought nothing of it until we heard another thud right next to my open window. A rock the size of a small melon had been thrown with great power and even more impressive accuracy towards us and landed a couple of feet short of the vehicle. It hit the ground so violently that I was sprayed with muddy rainwater right into my face. That was it. My window came up. Not that a window would have stood a chance against a rock that size, but it made me feel better knowing there was something between us and whatever had just hurled a 30-pound rock. We were considering our options, which in all honesty shouldn't have taken as long as it did. It was obvious that we should have just gotten the heck out of Dodge at that very moment, but for some reason we stalled on making our getaway. I looked up and out of the front window and then quickly hushed the others, telling them to look dead ahead. Our car was pointed as though we would drive straight up the hill to the next hairpin that was perhaps 50 feet away. The incline put the gravel level at about 10 to 12 feet higher than we were. We all saw it. Rather, we saw its eyes. Two big round amber-colored eyes hovered about six inches apart, and what I estimated to be some 11 feet off the ground. This thing must have been immense in height and stature. I have always been a bit big for my boots with a chip on my shoulder, a naturally brave person. It helps being 5 foot 10 and 230 pounds of muscle from manual farm work and many hours in the gym. Jack isn't a small guy either, standing six feet tall and weighing around 215 pounds. But Scott was a mere 5'10 and 170 pounds. Being the brave boy I am, I got out of the car to get a better look. Scott and Jack were both yelling, What the hell are you doing, Jay? Come back. Get back in here. We need to leave. I gave them a soft hush and started to slowly make my way up towards the eye shine. Maybe I was hoping it was an owl perched on a low branch. As I got nearer, I realized this wasn't the case. I started to make out the creature's outline, and as I did, I stopped dead in my tracks. This thing was enormous. I was now maybe 30 feet away from it, and I could see that it had short but very thick legs, a long body, and thick long arms. If it had a neck, it was half an inch long. Either that or its shoulder muscles were the size of a grown pig. It was easily 10 or 11 feet tall and 4 to 5 feet wide at the shoulders. I just stared as it made a low huff with every breath. That was when I turned from a big brave boy to a scared little girl and started walking backwards towards the car. I got back in and quietly said, Drive. There was a pause before he reacted. But before Scott could turn the key in the ignition, we heard another thud. 
There was another rock, slightly smaller than the last, and it had been thrown and fell just shy of the vehicle. This time I screamed at Scott, Just drive, Scott! And he did. Never before has a 1,000cc hatchback been driven so quickly. Fair play to Scott for the previous unseen skill. Thinking about it now, I don't think whatever this creature was wanted to hurt us, it just wanted us to go. Mission accomplished and we got out, nor did we return to this spot for several weeks. I had another encounter with this thing and it happened some months later in a different area of our surrounding woodlands, but only two miles or so from the spot I visited with Scott and Jack. I was hiking alone in the springtime near a derelict castle called Gerich, Ger Gerich Castle. I'm sure I got that wrong. It has been long abandoned, though many attempts have been made to restore the castle. It was in the middle of the afternoon with many hours of daylight left. I'd heard stories of dogs going missing here, but I figured they just ran off and never found their owners, as it is a large area. However, I found evidence to suggest otherwise. I came across a small black fur. At first, I thought it was a local's farm sheep that had strayed and perhaps caught its wool on the brush. And as I got closer, I realized it was fur and not wool. A little further up the trail, I found some more, a lot more. A full Labrador's coat of black fur. There were a few bones lit clean. Some had been splintered as if bitten with great force. I started to get the feeling that I was being watched. That's when I heard a loud wood on wood knock. I shot to an upright stance and stared intently in the direction from which it came, but I saw nothing. After my previous encounter several months earlier, I wanted nothing to do with this. I turned back into the frightened little girl again. I spun around and hightailed it back down the trail and broke from the tree line faster than I knew I could. Lily! Hush! Lily! Quit barking! I'm Lily! Oh my gosh, this dog. It's my little pug. She won't shut up. She barks at everything. I'm sorry to interrupt this story. I spun around and hightailed it back down the trail and broke from the tree line faster than I knew I could. I've told no one about these two encounters until now. Neither Scott nor Jack have spoken of it either. I didn't even tell them about the second encounter, nor have I had another encounter or seen any signs of it since. In my mind, there's nothing that is going to tell me otherwise, although I thought Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and Yeti lived in North America and Russia. I know now that they are on UK soil as well. Bigfoot lives in my town, discreetly and quietly, without being seen or heard by the majority of people. I hope to God that it stays that way, and he signs off Jay. Okay, here's another email from a woman, and she does not want her name disclosed. She wants to be anonymous, and that is no problem at all. She writes, I live in West Virginia. We have a few bears that make themselves known every now and again, but my dog is my protector. For over a month, he was barking at the entrance to the forest every time I went outside. I just chalked it up to being a bear. I have over two acres of lawn that has to be my responsibility to keep up since my husband passed away. At the end of my garden boxes, there's a stretch of grass next to the hemlock spruce that surrounds the yard and separates it from the forest. I was going about my normal mowing duty around the ends of the garden boxes when a massive black hand reached out and touched my face as if to just feel my face. This hand was extremely calloused and dark, even the palms. There was no way it belonged to a man. I was scared. I was so scared that I pushed the handles on the zero-turn lawnmower as hard as I could, and I did not look back. I jumped off the mower at the front porch and I ran inside. The mower sat there for three days because I wasn't coming out of that house for any reason. Although I had never been one to believe in Bigfoot, I did a computer search. I had always considered it a fable or a way for people to get attention. But now I know. 
I reasoned with myself that these things have been there always. Apparently, one just finally got curious to know what a human feels like. If I could just convince myself that they're not going to hurt me, I think I would feel better going back outside. But I'm still not so brave. I like for my house to look neat, and I do a lot of work myself. I was giving my garage a fresh coat of paint when I heard walking in the woods. They were heavy footsteps with breaking twigs and rustling leaves. I was fine until they stopped just to my right in the tree line. I didn't know what to do, so I did what any dummy would do. I started singing. I sang several songs and nothing happened, so I finished the painting and I went back inside. There was another time I was washing my car, and just as I was finishing, I heard the sound of breaking twigs once again. They stopped within 20 feet of me, somewhere in the tree line. This time I heard a sound like a very big man sitting down on something that was way too short. Boom! It was very loud. I could see inside the tree line, but I was too afraid to look closer. I stay inside a lot now. I have a new husband, and when I told him, he laughed at me. I think he thought I was joking. Now, I've never mentioned it again to anyone until now. If they are still there, I will leave them alone as long as they leave me alone. I'll listen to your stories, and it keeps me from thinking that I'm completely insane. Okay, this last story is, uh, it, the man says you can call me B. This may not be a Bigfoot story, but let's read on and see. Back in 1982, I had an experience in Bullitt County, Kentucky, that has kept me out of the woods until this day. I had just gotten my driver's license, so I borrowed my dad's 77 custom van to go on a double date. I swung by and picked up my friend Chuck and the two girls, and we headed out into the country to go parking. Back then, the thing to do was go parking, indulge a little underage drinking, and explore the mysteries of the opposite sex. So that was our plan. We drove down to the Salt River Bottoms along a one-lane gravel road. It was a pretty desolate spot with the occasional house or farm every few miles. But there were a few spots where we could pull off the road and be alone with our dates. The sun had already set. We were looking for one of those spots to pull over, so we were already traveling slow when Chuck suddenly asked, What was that? A hundred feet in front of us, something large and black was lying on the road. I slowed the van to a crawl. As we got closer, I started thinking it looked like a cow laying there with its back to us. Once we got to within 10 feet of it, I decided to get a better look, so I put the van in park and opened the door to get out. As I did so, it made a loud metal clanking sound those van doors are famous for. That thing on the road popped its head up and looked right at us. This thing was covered in black hair. It had the head of a dog with a large snout and ears that stood upright. It felt like all the blood rushed out of my body and my hair stood on end as I sat there looking at it. Chuck kept asking, what is that thing? But I couldn't register a logical explanation or give him a reasonable answer. This thing was huge. It must have weighed 700 pounds or more. Dogs don't get that big. It locked eyes on us for maybe 10 seconds, and all we could do was stare back at it. Then the impossible happened. This monster of an animal stood up on two feet. It took a step towards us and put what looked like a hand on the hood of the van with enough pressure to rock it backward. My God, it had to be at least nine feet tall. It had to bend down to look at us through the windshield, and it glared down at us like a predator savoring its next meal right before it strikes. And that's when we saw its teeth. It had a mouth full of sharp canines like a wolf or a werewolf. The girls were in the back screaming and crying, and I was frozen in place. Chuck finally shouted, Get us out of here! And that brought me back to reality. I grabbed the shifter and dropped it into gear and I pushed the accelerator to the floorboard. We spun out, leaving a rooster tail of gravel and dusk in our wake. The monster, that's how I think of it, rolled off to the passenger side. It was a good thing he went that way. The driver's door was still open. 
At least he could have torn the door off. At worst, well, I don't want to think about the worst. I didn't slow down until we were back on the pavement. and The girls were inconsolable, so we took them home. There's nothing like a werewolf to put a damper on teenage hormones. Chuck and I... (laughs) Oh, man, that thing ruined your date. Uh, Chuck and I downed a few beers before I dropped him off just to calm our nerves. Of course, of course you did. We must have been in shock or something. I don't remember either one of us speaking a word about what had just happened. Once I dropped him off, I drove home and I went straight to bed. The next morning, I was abruptly awakened by my dad who made me go out to the driveway and look at the van. I expected to be yelled at for driving gravel roads and covering his black van with dust, but that wasn't what he wanted me to see. Pointing at the hood, he demanded, What the hell did you do to the van last night, boy? I walked over to where he was standing and I saw five large, deep claw marks running across the hood. What could I say? Uh, Sorry about that, Dad. Must have been that giant werewolf that did it. He would have thought I was nuts, so I just said, I don't know, and I had to pay for a new paint job anyway. A few days later, Chuck finally asked me what the hell we saw that night. I still didn't have an answer. The girls were pretty much done with us. Bringing a werewolf to a date has a way of doing that. This was all back in 1982, so we didn't have the internet to look these things up. Heck, we didn't even have cable until the following year. To this day, the only thing that I have seen that even closely resembles what we saw that night is the werewolf in the movie Van Helsing. Watching that movie made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. From what I've seen on the internet, I'm guessing it was a dogman that we saw. And here's something more. I have an uncle and three cousins who were all police officers. A few months after this happened, I was playing nickel and dime poker with the family when I overheard my cousin, a Jefferson County canine officer, saying that a woman's body was found up in a tree and torn to shreds at Tom Wallace Park. I took him outside and told him the story of what happened to my friends and me just a few months earlier. Although he did listen intently at the time, albeit with a look of bewilderment on his face, We never spoke of it again. Years later, he was shot and killed in the line of duty. I don't know exactly what I saw out there on that gravel road that night, but I do know that it was bad, nasty, evil, and deadly. God only knows what would have happened if we'd already been parked there and it crept up on us. I'm not afraid of the woods, but I'm terrified of what I know is out there lurking around in them. Just look at all the people who go missing, never to be seen or heard from again. Here's an email from Mike, and this is real interesting. He says, I'm sharing this with you because I recently came across your channel on YouTube. I've noticed several similarities to what you read about and what happened to me eight years ago. I want to start off by saying, I don't know what I saw. I can't say it was or was not a Bigfoot, nor will I say I don't believe anymore. I grew up in Swiss, Missouri. At the beginning of the email, he gives me a little bit of a description of Swiss, Missouri, and it sounds like a really great place in the in the Ozarks in Missouri. It's really nice wine country, I think. Sounds very appealing to me. He writes, while growing up, I hunted and fished all over the area. I even swam in most of the creeks. My family roots date back to the turn of the century here in Swiss. My great-great-grandfather's farm was a whopping five miles east of where I live today. Through the years growing up there, nothing ever happened that I would consider odd or out of place. As the years passed, I hit adulthood and moved away thinking there was something better out there. Then in 2011, I moved back knowing where I wanted to plant my roots. I ended up buying acreage connecting to our family farm and I built a home and a barn. I had approximately 20 chickens and 5 guineas at this time. Unfortunately, ticks are rough out this way and both chickens and guineas enjoy eating them. So I felt this was a decent investment, plus the eggs were good. 
It was in the early spring, April 5th to be exact, a cool evening, windows open, and my fiance and I were sitting on the couch watching a show on TV when I heard a fuss outside. My dog started barking and raising cane, so I muted the TV and got off the couch. Walking into the dining room, I heard what I believed were coyotes trying to get at my chickens. I walked back into the living room and into my bedroom to grab my gun. As I walked back into the dining room, I heard my dog really let loose because he was extremely protective of his chickens. I flipped on the back porch lights. I walked out onto the deck, which sits approximately six to seven feet off the ground, and I could see something in the shadows, and my old dog had his hair standing straight up and barking and growling like he'd gone mad. I fired several rounds into the woods that backed into the natural-fed Spring Creek. I heard what sounded like a freight train crashing through the woods. After a few minutes, I called my dog back up to the house, and we went in. I told my fiancé that what had happened, and she said maybe a cow had gotten out or something. I thought for a minute, and I said, yeah, I guess that's what it could have been. Three days later, on Friday evening, my fiancé and I went into Herman for dinner and to visit some friends. We got home late sometime just before midnight. We were pretty wore out, but I always checked the barn and the chickens when I got home. As I walked to the chicken coop, I noticed a feeder laying on the ground. I picked it up, and thinking my dog had somehow got a hold of it and drug it out in the yard, As I approached the chicken coop, I noticed a hole in the chicken wire approximately six feet up, and the hole was about 18 to 20 inches around. I opened the coop, and I noticed blood and feathers were everywhere, but only a couple of chickens were gone. I figured somehow a coyote or a fox had to get into the coop, but I couldn't comprehend why or who had made this hole that size and that high up off the ground. However, this is the price to raising any small animals out in the sticks. The chicken wire portion of my coop is only four feet wide and six feet long. I normally let the chickens out and run freely to eat ticks and peck the ground, so I didn't feel I needed a large run area in the coop. However, that night, I rounded them up and fed them and kept them locked in the coop due to the coyotes and foxes in the area. This is my attempt at making it as hard as possible for them to be dinner, and the predators will move on down the road. Later that same night, after patching the hole with some scrap chicken wire, I showered and got into bed, wore out and ready to sleep. I had just hit that spot where you're asleep, but still somewhat alert and extremely comfortable. When my old dog started his crazy barking, and then I heard this howl, scream, growling noise I have never heard in my life coming from the backyard. I grew up almost 18 years in this area and just moved back after being gone for only five years. I hunt and I trap everything you can think of. I've heard a fox scream. I've heard a bobcat scream. I've heard mountain lions and black bear. I've heard deer grunts and turkeys gobble. But I have never, ever, ever heard this noise before. Now due to our closest neighbor being approximately a quarter mile away, and that was family I knew, no one would be on my property this late. So as I sat up trying to comprehend the noise and understand what I had heard, I grabbed for my 300 wind mag, fearing that this isn't an average, everyday animal. And then I heard what I thought to be fencing being torn. My dog was already at the back door, begging to be let out. He knew something wasn't right. I opened the door, stepping onto the deck after turning on the porch lights, and all I could see was something near the coop. My old dog took off full sprint towards it. Now, he's fought off countless coyotes and foxes, but tonight he wasn't ready for this thing. He got close, and I heard the screaming growl that I can't explain, and before I knew it, my dog flew into the side of my deck. This was a good 20 feet away from where this thing was. Well, now I was furious, thinking that it had killed my dog, and I leveled my rifle, and I shot everything I had in it, five rounds total, and again, I heard crashing like a freight train going down into the woods near the creek. 
I rushed down and grabbed my dog, scared to death that it was too late. He was about 70 pounds of pure muscle. I picked him up and got him inside. I put him on the table and I turned on the dining room light and I was horrified that he was gashed down his side like a razor blade had cut him. He was whining and in tremendous pain. He was having trouble breathing and he had lost a ton of blood. I know growing up on the farm that it's not right to allow an animal to suffer. It's not fair to the animal, in my opinion, to let it lay there and die. I knew what I needed to do, even though it would kill me to do it. I took him back outside in the front yard, and I told him that he was a good boy and how much I loved him, and that it was time for me to put him out of his misery. I lost my best friend that night. I spent the next hour digging a hole with my fiancé holding a flashlight and a gun just to make sure that that thing didn't come back. As I buried my dog, I felt anger at this animal for killing my dog. I felt fear because I wasn't sure what it was, and then I felt empty because there was nothing I could do. The next morning, I went out to see the damage. This thing completely destroyed the chicken wire and the only thing that saved the remaining 11 chickens and all the guineas was the actual wood coop. However, it had damaged the roof on the coop too. I believe what angered this thing when it let out that god-awful sound was the fact that it was unable to get in the coop and grab more chickens. I spent the next two days rebuilding the coop and following the trail this thing had made into the woods. I never saw any footprints or tracks, nor did I find blood or hair. But I will tell you that it's now 2019, almost exactly eight years later. And other than that curious fox or annoying coyote, I have had no issues. I have never heard that noise again, and I still live in that same home, now married to that same woman. And we have a new dog who will be eight in July. I will never forget that day, and I'll never forget that sound that that thing made, and I'll never forget the fear that that thing brought. I'm not going to say for sure that this was a Bigfoot, nor will I say that it wasn't. I can tell you that I've been to several states hunting bear, boar, elk, and deer. I've spent more hours in the woods than your average joke, and I've never felt that fear. I've never seen or heard anything that can compare to that thing. 